Well, good morning. Please turn with me to the gospel according to Isaiah. I mean that. The gospel according to Isaiah, chapter 35. I will read the whole chapter. It says here, The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals, where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go upon it, go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Amen. If you will, uh, I would like to just pray one more time. Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would help us to see what you have written there in Isaiah 35. And please help with your rivers of living water. Aid us and help this poor lisp lisping, stammering tongue. Loosen it, Lord, so that my brethren will be edified and that we will behold your glory. In the name of Christ, our King. Amen. So I am faced with an insurmountable challenge this morning to analyze and dissect this mind-blowing and breathtaking portrait of eternal joy and unparalleled bliss. I, I by no means am going to do this text any justice, uh, much less in the space of an hour. There, there's a sense in which the words that are written here are too wonderful to even take apart and scrutinize. With rich poetic style and vivid imagery, Isaiah describes to his audience the glorious salvation, the glorious blessing to come for God's people. And mind you, Isaiah is not acting like the prophetic weatherman here. He's not giving us the, the, the prophetic forecast you know, cloudy with a chance of rain. He's not monotonously giving us what's going to happen in the future. He is an artist here. He is painting a picture. And with masterful strokes, he poetically describes God's amazing redemptive work. And he uses all these intense, vivid, graphic metaphors that appeal to our senses. And this is a, a literary masterpiece right here. Uh, a masterpiece that is overwhelmingly staggering. And as is with the case of, of any work of art, it will not simply do to just analyze the text in a, in a scholarly way and just take apart all the words and tell you what all the words mean. This, this means this in the Hebrew. This text was not meant to be merely analyzed. It was meant to be felt, to be experienced. 
And it is my hope and prayer that you would come in with me, come to this text and experience it, feel it. That you would be brought into hope and to joy at the salvation of the Lord. As of late, uh, my family and I, well, me and my wife and, and, and me, especially I have been in a very, very dark uh, place, period of, of, of intense darkness, a distressing season, and uh, not only physical ailments, uh, depression, anxiety, etc., feeling like we are being attacked on, on all sides, and I've been needing an, an escape. And I've been wanting to escape to, to the, the hope that there is in, in, in the Word of God, the hope of salvation, the salvation to come. I have been in need of some biblical escapism. Escapism is, is not bad in and of itself. You know, people to escape their problems. Some people try to find escape in alcohol or drugs or some even in entertainment, fiction. And, you know, reading a fiction book or, or, or seeing a, a movie that is fiction or fantasy is not bad in and of itself. But... There's no better place to escape to than God's word and God's promises and reality. We are, we all, all of us are in need of, of an escape into reality. What is going to happen? Because what the Bible tells us is going to happen and has happened is better than any work of fiction. So, and, and I, thinking about the text that I could choose which will help us to, to escape into God's reality. I, I've been wanting to go to the Old Testament because I, I love the Old Testament. I, I love digging into the Old Testament, seeing Christ in the Old Testament. So I chose Isaiah, Isaiah 35. This is a glorious text. If you are weary, if you are heavy laden, if you are oppressed, if you are beset by physical and spiritual mental ailments, if you are languishing due to past failures, if you are dwelling in the midst of darkness right now, you would do well to fill your mind with truths like, like this text. And set your mind and your heart on the heavenly hope that we have. So having said that, we will behold this text, this passage of scripture in four parts. We're going to divide up this into four parts. First, we will see the backdrop of Isaiah 35. So we are beholding a portrait, a painting. And first, we need to see the backdrop of this portrait. In order to get a fuller appreciation of what is being described here, we need some context. Now, the book of Isaiah is divided into two parts. Isaiah chapters 1 through 39 and Isaiah chapters 40 to 66. And this passage comes to us at the end of the first half of Isaiah, at the end of the first act, if you will. This is the climactic ending of the first act. Now, chapters 36 to 39, um, they, they tell us about the story of Hezekiah and everything that, you know, him crying out to the Lord and, and God dealing with him. And that passage or that those truths told in, in those chapters are found elsewhere in the scriptures. That's kind of a transitional uh, text. For all intents and purposes, chapter 35 is the last part of the first half of Isaiah. This is the, the climactic ending, the pinnacle of God's saving work, the saving work that he promises that he will do. And this chapter is found in a section, more specifically speaking, in a section in which God is rebuking his own people. Chapters 38 through, uh, sorry, 28 through 35. God pronounces judgment upon his own people mainly and also on Assyria. And there is a ser series of six ahs, A-H, ah, or woes, if you want to translate it into our terminology an exclamation of alarm and of lament, of grief. God rebukes his people and God announces judgment. 
And at the same time, God is announcing the coming of the Messiah and the glories that will accompany his coming. And prior to chapter 35, this, these announcements of judgment uh, culminate with Isaiah 34, in which God announces judgment over the whole world, not only over specific nations, not only over Israel and Judah, but the whole world. And in Isaiah 34, we have a horrifying portrait of judgment. I mean, it, it is fearful. It is frightening if you read it. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but if you want, you could just turn to Isaiah 34 real quick. In Isaiah 34, 1, the Lord indicts the nations, and he declares his wrath and fury. Uh, starting from that text and in verse 2 as well. And he tells us in this chapter that judgment day is coming for the whole world. Verse 8, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. And this judgment is described with graphic metaphorical imagery. We get pictures of mounds and mounds of fetid, stinking corpses filling the world and their blood running everywhere, so much so that the mountains erode. We get a picture of the host of heaven falling, the stars falling, the heavens being rolled up like a scroll. We get a picture here of terrifying slaughter wrought by the Lord's sword. The Lord's sword is, is described there as being filled with blood and fatness. The judgment of the Lord is compared to the dismemberment of Animals for the sacrifice. They soak the land with blood and fat. Even the dust is filled with fat and blood. There's a picture here also of fire and brimstone reminiscent of Sodom and Gomorrah. And smoke that ascends forever and ever in eternal torment. This is Isaiah's version of Revelation 20 and 21. Where he talks about the lake of fire. In fact... Chapter 20 of Revelation draws on this text. Horrifying picture. There's vivid imagery of a desert, wilderness teeming with thorns and thistles, a sign of the curse. And inhabiting this desert, this wasteland, are unclean birds and all sorts of unclean animals and if you really take the time to study the description of each animal, you'll see that some of these animals are actually demonic entities. And you'll also see that in Revelation 18, where it also alludes to this text. We get a picture of hell, essentially. Eternal damnation in hell. And in verse 5 of this text, Edom is mentioned. And we're told that Edom will be destroyed. Now, Edom is described here, and this is uh, referring to, you know, the nation of Edom, the descendants of Esau. And they were enemies of God's people. But uh, when he mentions Edom here, it's symbolic of the whole world. In a similar way that, you know, Revelation talks about Babylon. And it's not just talking about one nation. It's talking about the whole. Babylon represents, symbolizes the world system, the enemies of God. And so Edom represents here the enemies of God's people, those who are unbelieving, those who have refused to trust in the Lord, whether they be from Israel or from the other nations. And finally, here in this chapter, in verse 31, uh, sorry, verse 11, uh, we're told that there is confusion and emptiness. And these two terms are terms that are found in Genesis 1-2, where it says that the, the world was formless and void. There is the phrase uh, in Hebrew, tohu wa bohu. So these two words, tohu and bohu, are used here. The world is described as formless and void. There, it, we're reverting back. There is a creation reversal. You know, whenever God judges, the major judgments of God in, in the Bible, they're described as a reversal of creation going back into the darkness. So this is judgment here in Isaiah 34. And so the glory and the glorious salvation of Isaiah 35 must be viewed against the backdrop of God's judgment in Isaiah 34. These two texts go together. 
The absolutely frightening picture of wrath and judgment in Isaiah 34 is the black canvas against which Isaiah 35 contrasts. Isaiah 35 shines brightly against the backdrop of the previous chapter. The glory of God's salvation is more clearly outlined when placed against the deep darkness of judgment. And we can appreciate the salvation of God more when it's placed against the backdrop of God's horrifying wrath. So that, first we see that, the, the, the backdrop, the, the black canvas. Now, secondly, let's take a look at the picture that we see in, uh, see in Isaiah 35. Let's see what, what picture Isaiah paints here. Let's behold this text itself and this image and, and how this would translate into Isaiah's time and his original audience. The first thing we need to notice about Isaiah 35 is that Isaiah is using Exodus terminology to describe salvation. I don't know if you noticed this when we were reading the text, but we can't, can't afford to miss this. Isaiah uses phrases and themes related to the Exodus. He, he's using terms that Israel can understand to describe salvation. For the Israelites, the Exodus was the pinnacle of God's redemptive activity. This Exodus episode was, was the greatest act of salvation for the Israelites and Subsequent to the Exodus, whenever God describes the salvation that he's going to do, he describes it using Exodus terminology. So the Exodus becomes the model, the prototype for God's redemptive work. We know from Scripture that the Exodus was a mere type. As great and as awesome as the Exodus was. It was only a type of the greater Exodus to come that was to be realized in the Messiah. And that is what Isaiah is talking about here. The work that, that God would do in the future was, was comparable to the Exodus, but it was on a greater scale. There's a greater Exodus described here. And notice Isaiah, as I mentioned, he's using... Exodus terminology, Exodus language. language. He, he talks about the wilderness, and the saints of God in the wilderness. That should remind you of the Exodus. He, he talks about God coming to save his people with vengeance. That is kind of a reminder of the Exodus. He talks about water bursting forth in the wilderness, in the desert. That should remind you of passages like Exodus 17, where water bursts forth from the rock. God's people are referred to as the redeemed. That is for sure Exodus terminology. God redeemed Israel out of Egypt. He purchased them. We find in verse 9 of this text, the redeemed, and in verse 10, the ransomed. The redeemed emphasizes the one who is doing the redeeming, the redeemer. The word ransom emphasizes the price, how much it costs. He ransoms his people. Exodus language these people are, that were purchased by Yahweh himself. They're, they're going to be redeemed again. They're going to be redeemed from slavery, from bondage, from their enemies. And we see also a picture here of God's people as pilgrims marching on the way to Zion on a highway. And they're abounding with joy. And that probably would have evoke, evoked images um, to Isaiah's audi audience of after, they cross, after the crossing of the Red Sea, you remember how God's people were rejoicing. And they sing the song of Moses. They sing the song of Miriam. And Miriam and the women are with their tambourines, dancing and rejoicing and singing. God is telling his people here in this text, I'm going to do that again, but on a greater scale. There is going to be even more rejoicing. And we know that this is the final exodus. This is the final exodus. In the original exodus, God's people were taken to the promised land. Well, God used the exodus to take God's people to the promised land. Here, God's people will be taken to the promised land. We, we see them going to Zion. 
And this is going to be the final exodus. And how do I know this is the final exodus? Because, again, the previous chapter, judgment upon the whole world. And it's over. That's it. And in this chapter, we see eternal joy, never-ending joy. This is the final exodus that God is promising his people. And the first exodus only pales in comparison to this final exodus that God is promising here. And we see here not only salvation from God's enemies, but a reversal of the curse. Verse 1, here it talks about the wilderness, the wasteland, and the desert, using three terms that talk about the same thing. The wilderness, the wasteland, the desert, or the, or the Arabah. All these will be transformed. There's unexpected transformation. Now, the, de the desert is the complete opposite of paradise. You remember Eden. Eden was a fertile land abounding in lush vegetation with an overabundance of food. Adam had everything he could have wanted there in Eden. The presence of God, greenery everywhere. He was in a, a, a lush paradise. But because of man's sin, God curses the ground. And then what does he tell Adam and Eve? The ground will now produce briars and thorns, thistles. Cultivating the land would be hard. And so the desert, subsequent to this desert, becomes the picture in the Bible of the curse. You couldn't have a, a, a more vivid picture of the curse than a wasteland where there isn't life. There is death. Where you can't stay for too long because you're going to die you're, uh, uh, from thirst, from hunger. Where there are all these unclean, ravenous beasts that roam. This picture of desert is a picture of the curse. And this desert symbolism, I believe, not, all, not only talks to us about the environment of the world, but also the people in it. The world is portrayed here in Isaiah 35 as a desert. And this desert all of a sudden starts to blossom. It is transformed. It flourishes. All sorts of plants and vegetation, flowers spring up from it. It is transformed to resemble Lebanon, Carmel, Sharon or Sharon. I don't know how to pronounce that. Now these places were places known for their dense vegetation and, and foliage, for their fertility, for their beauty. These were absolutely beautiful places and still are. They were known for their flowers, for their forests, for their greenery, for their streams of water, for their fruitfulness. So what is Isaiah telling us here in the text? The parched wasteland is turned into an Eden, is turned into a paradise, the place of death. The place of scarcity and hunger and thirst is turned into a place of abundance. The place of desolation is turned into a place of flourishment. And of the presence of God, the very presence of God, as we'll see in a moment. And notice here that, that the desert is personified in verses 1 and 2. It's personified as rejoicing, singing. The deserts will sing. Now that reminds me of, uh, of Romans chapter 8. You remember when Paul says there that the earth groans. The earth there is personified, is groaning, is awaiting the manifestation of the sons of God, the revelation of the sons of God and of glory. Well, here the earth is personified as rejoicing because he's telling us about when that happens, when glory comes. The curse is undone. The alienation is undone. The place of death and, and, and of famish Famishment becomes a place of life and rejoicing. And in place of desolation, as I said, there is the presence of God, the glory of Yahweh. Verse 2, it says here at the end, they shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Now this word glory in Hebrew, kabod, is literally weight, heaviness. The heaviness, the, the heaviness of the presence of God. It, it fills the earth. 
You might also imagine the glory cloud that appeared in the tabernacle in the wilderness or the glory cloud that appeared in in Solomon's temple when it was built. What is it that brings about the transformation of the wilderness, of the death of death, of the curse, the, the glorious presence of God? And verses 5 through 7 give us a similar picture. Here we see in verses 5 through 7 that there is healing. Diseases are healed. Ailments and affliction are taken away. All of this is undone. The blind see. The deaf hear. The lame leap. It says they leap like a deer. Have you ever seen a a deer leaping? Man, those animals can can jump over cars. (laughs) I've seen videos of them. I was, you know, researching for this text. I was watching some videos of deer jumping over fences and cars. Man, that's, they, they can jump real high. The lame will leap like a deer. Amazing. This is a picture of, of God's glorious healing, miraculous healing, supernatural work. The mute will sing. They will sing for joy. In the original Exodus, God did many miraculous works. God redeemed his people through the plagues. But none of God's miraculous works in the original Exodus were like this. In the Exodus, God brought about death and sickness to Egypt. But here, God's miraculous works bring about life. Healing, restoration, rejuvenation, refreshment. The plagues of Egypt were the undoing of God's creative order. Again, we're going back to the chaos, the chaos waters, the darkness. But here, God orders the darkness. Here, God brings symmetry and order and life. It's almost like Genesis 1. God says, let there be light, and there is light. And we see the source of of all this unprecedented healing in verses 5 and 6. Here in verse 6, it says, Four waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. How will will all these miracles take place? How will the the, the, the sick be healed? Waters will burst forth from the wilderness, living water. And this is reminiscent not only of the Exodus, but also of Eden. Out of Eden flowed the river of life, and it watered the garden. And also, later on, God would speak to his people through Ezekiel, and he would talk about the temple, the eschatological, the end times temple, from which flowed the river of of living water, river of life. So it's this water that is a source of healing. It is this water that turns... In in verse 7, the scorched land into pools, into springs. Grassy marshes emerge where unclean desert animals used to live. And if you read prior to this text in Isaiah, for example, Isaiah 32, 15, and also later on in Isaiah 44, 3, you'll see that the Holy Spirit is connected with this water. This water is a symbolic reference to the work of, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So again, it's the presence of God that brings about all this restoration. And finally, in Isaiah 35, we have this description of a road, a road that emerges in the midst of this Eden-like environment. It's called the Highway of Holiness in verse 8. It's a way that leads to the place of God's presence, to Zion, verse 10. Zion was a place where the temple was, Mount Zion. That was a place where God manifested his presence in a special way. And so we have a picture here of God's people, the redeemed. They're, they're not, you know, it's not everybody. It's only the redeemed, the ransom. They are on this road. They are on this way, this highway of holiness. And the presence of God is there with them and among them. And yet they are going to the place of the presence of God. I think that's an interesting image right there. What is it talking to us about? Well, going deeper. Deeper and deeper and deeper into the presence of God. 
and as we'll see in a few moments, going into you know, uh, experiencing the, the final fulfillment, the, the new creation, what we read about in Revelation 21 and 22. So we have the saints in the highway, this highway of holiness. Unclean hypocrites will not be in this highway. I think that might, may, may have been an implicit warning to Isaiah's hearers, to the hypocrites, sinners in Zion, as he describes in Isaiah 33. The unclean will not be in this highway, only the redeemed. There's no hypocrites. This is a place of absolute security. We're told here in the text also that in verse 9, there, there are no lions that will be there. No ravenous beasts will be upon it. Safety. Safety from the enemies uh, that would assail a traveler. You know, in those times, if you were to travel from one city to another, you didn't have to worry about traffic accidents. You didn't have to worry about car crashes. But you did have to worry about ravenous beasts that could maul you or robbers on the way that could, that could you know, beat you up or kill you, take all your things. But there will be none of that in this highway. There is absolute safety. It is secure. And the people of God are secure from the dangers on the outside, the external dangers, but they're also secure from the dangers on the inside, from their own folly. Even the foolish saints will not err. Will, they will not get deviated from the way. Even, even the, the folly of the saints will not, uh, will, will not make them be lost. They are forever secure. So here we have an image, as I said, of safety, security, even of purpose, meaning. The pilgrims are on this way to Zion. They have a destination. They have a purpose. They have a goal. That reminds me of what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, leaving those things which are behind me and stretching forth toward what is in front of me. I, st I stretch forth. I press on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. That is these saints right here. They're going deeper into the presence of God. They're, going, they're rejoicing. They're singing. It says here in verse 10, with everlasting joy on their heads, this is a picture of them wearing joy on their heads like, as if it were an ornament or perhaps a better picture would be the oil of gladness upon their heads. They are shouting with joy. And they, in, in verse 10, um, they shall obtain joy and gladness. They are overtaking, possessing joy. And all sorrow and all sighing flees away. There's no more pain, no more grief. Again, the curse is Reverse, reversed and undone. So this is the picture that Isaiah is painting to his audience. This is the picture that God wants us to see. Let's move on to the third thing. The interpretation of Isaiah 35. Now that we've seen the backdrop and the picture itself, let's see what this painting means. What, what does this all mean for Isaiah's audience, what does this mean for us specifically? I mean, I've explained a little bit of what this means, but what, what does this specifically have to do with us? And how is this all fulfilled? When is it all fulfilled? Every painting has an interpretation, right? Well, let me rephrase that. Every painting prior to uh, the, the postmodern period <laughs> had an interpretation. <laughs> the, the, the artist makes a painting and wants you to interpret, wants you to try to figure out what he, what he was talking about. Or what he was painting, rather. So this painting has an interpretation. What is the interpretation? When is this all fulfilled? When does this happen? That's a good question to ask. When does this all happen? Does this all find fulfillment after the return from exile from Babylon? You know, some 200 years later, Judah would be conquered by Babylon. And then some decades after that, they would come back. They would come back into the land and they would rebuild the temple that was destroyed. 
Some might be tempted to think, well, that was the fulfillment of Isaiah 35. No, it wasn't. And if you read the book of Ezra, you read Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, you'll see that it clearly was not the fulfillment of Isaiah 35. It was a mini fulfillment. It was a mini picture of what was to come. But as soon as they build the temple, what happens to the, to the elders of, of Israel? What, what, how, what is their reaction? How do they react? They weep. They are discouraged because this second temple building is nothing like the first. And the Messiah has not come and the glory has not come. They are despondent. That was not the fulfillment. And neither is the fulfillment of this text what happened to Israel in the 40s. Israel being reconstituted a nation again. (laughs) That was not the fulfillment. In spite of what the dispensationists will, will tell you, that was not the fulfillment of Isaiah 35. Jews planting Uh, potatoes and corn in in Palestine is not the the wilderness becoming an Eden. (laughs) That is not the fulfillment. No, there there was a greater fulfillment to come and Isaiah was talking about something better than that. You you know when this, this all began to be fulfilled? When did God's people see the glory of Yahweh? John 1, 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt, or literally tabernacled, made, made his tent among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as a, of the only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. This was fulfilled, it began to be fulfilled when the Son came, the one who calls himself the temple of God, the real place of the presence of God, the king that was spoken of in Isaiah, the king that came bringing the powers of the new creational kingdom, the people in in Jesus' day got a foretaste of the glory, of the powers of the world to come. Wherever Jesus went, the curse was reversed. Jesus would touch lepers. And what happened to the lepers? He he touched these unclean people. He would not become unclean. They became clean. He would heal the sick. They would be made whole. He would cast out demons from people. Cast out these ravenous beasts. People would be made whole. The multitudes were restored. Blind eyes were opened. The ears of the deaf were unstopped. The lame would leap. And there were miracles as had never been seen prior you remember john chapter 9 this blind man blind from birth is healed and he says never has it been seen in history that a man blind from birth has been given sight and jesus would do all these glorious miracles through the operation of the holy spirit which he calls the finger of god and jesus himself talked about the holy spirit in john 7 he promised the holy spirit to those who would believe He talks about rivers of living water springing forth from the hearts of those who believe, speaking of the Spirit. And in John 4, in a dry, arid land, Jesus speaks to this Samaritan woman and he offers her what? Living water. Jesus is the eschatological temple promised in Ezekiel. The river of life flows from him. He gives it to to those who are dying, to those who are thirsty, to those who are, who are cursed. Christ is a source of the river of life. And do you remember Mark 7, where Jesus heals this man who was uh, deaf and dumb, mute. He could not speak, he could not hear. What does Jesus do? He touches his ears, and then what? He... He spits. It wasn't because Jesus lacked manners. Why is Jesus spitting on the ground? And then he touches the man's tongue. And then this man, he says, uh, he tells this man, uh, that is, uh, he says, uh, may your ears be, well, how, how does it go? Uh, there's that, that term, ephrata, ephrata, I think. Be opened. His ears are open. His tongue is loosed. But why did Jesus spit on the ground? I think 
Jesus was symbolically showing us what Isaiah 35 says. Rivers of living water. It's the rivers of living water that cause, bring forth healing. And Jesus heals, not only heals, he saves. The miracles of Christ were only pictures of the salvation that he was bringing about. There were signs pointing to the spiritual healing and restoration, salvation from sin. Jesus comes and he's forgiving sins. He's cleansing people spiritually. He's creating joyful worshipers. He's spreading joy everywhere. In fact, in John chapter 2, we see that Jesus turns water into wine. Moses turned water into blood, signifying judgment and death. Jesus turns water into wine, signifying gladness and joy, the joy of his kingdom. Jesus speaks to us about the narrow way, the narrow way that leads to life. There are only two ways, two paths in this life. There is the narrow way that leads to life, and then there is Frank Sinatra's way. There are even some Christians who like that song, I did it my way. Well, that, that is the, the, the epitome of what sin is, my way. There's only God's way or my way. And not only does Jesus preach about the way, he says, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, Lord, show us the way to the Father. I am the way. I am the highway of holiness. You must come through me. You must be cleansed by me. You must be redeemed by me. You must be ransomed. And Jesus at the cross defeats the enemies of God. He defeats Satan he takes the curse for us and he rises again as the new creation, as the new Adam. And then he pours forth his spirit on the day of Pentecost upon his disciples. The, the exalted, enthroned Christ pours rivers of living waters. It's very interesting in the book of Acts, the operation of the Holy Spirit is described with water terminology, water language. Baptized, poured forth, Filled. And these waters cause more people to be saved. Once the, the apostles and the disciples are empowered with the Holy Spirit, they go out into the world. They proclaim the gospel and they spread this, wild, this uh, Eden everywhere. And Jesus comes and he turns everything into an Eden. Or wherever he goes, he turns it into an Eden. And then his disciples continue the work. That's what the book of Acts is about. What Jesus continued to do and to teach through his disciples. And you remember Acts chapter 3. This lame man, Peter and John, come up to him. Peter says, I don't have silver or gold, but what I have, I, I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up, walk. And this man rejoices after being healed. And he's walking and leaping and praising God. In Acts chapter 8, Philip the evangelist goes into a, a dry place, goes to Samaria, a, Samaria, a place of, of curse, a place of perdition, a place of sin and apostasy. He preaches the gospel and the, the sick are healed. People that are demonized are delivered. And what is the result of the gospel's preaching? People believe and there is rejoicing. And then God sends him to the Ethiopian eunuch and he preaches the gospel to the eunuch and the eunuch is baptized. And then what does it say in Acts 8? The eunuch goes his way rejoicing. Joy. We see the joy of Isaiah 35. So Isaiah 35 finds its fulfillment in Christ. But this is not only a, a past fulfillment for us, it, it is also an ongoing fulfillment because the book of Acts, there's a sense in which it is still going. Uh, I'm not exactly a fan of, of the Acts 29 network, but I believe that, uh, yeah, we are kind of like Acts 29, right? The, the last chapter of Acts, we are continuing the work of the disciples. We are the, the unwritten chapter of Acts. This is still being fulfilled through his church. The church is going forth and the wilderness is being turned into a paradise. 
And it will be in the end as well. When Jesus comes back. Now, there's something you, you need to understand about Old Testament prophecy. The prophets like Isaiah, when they announced the coming of the Messiah, they, they were looking at a mountain range. But they were looking at it from a one-dimensional perspective. They, they didn't look at it from the side. They didn't get a side view. They looked at it from the front. And it, it all looked like one, one mountain. So that, that's why, for example, in Isaiah, Isaiah, you have announcements of the Messiah, of his first coming and his suffering, and then announcements in the same, in the same context, in the same passage of the second coming. It's all mixed together. Because from Isaiah's vantage point, he didn't see that these mountains were separated by a big gap of thousands of years. He couldn't see that. We can see that from our perspective. But he couldn't. And so here in Isaiah 35, you also have a mixture of the first and the second coming of Christ. This passage began to be fulfilled when, when Christ came. But there are parts of this passage that haven't been fulfilled completely. You could even say that the whole passage itself hasn't been fulfilled in its consummate sense. Because although Jesus came bringing paradise with him, bringing the kingdom of God with him, we're still in a cursed world, right? We're still living in the wilderness. We are pilgrims in the wilderness. We are exiles here. So all has not been fulfilled in a final consummate way. We are living in this tension called the already, well, the theologians, theologians call the already and not yet. The scriptures have been fulfilled, but not fully. And as I mentioned, Isaiah didn't understand this, and many Jews didn't understand this. John the Baptist didn't understand this. In Matthew 11, when John the Baptist comes, he's proclaiming the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah, and then he's imprisoned. So he sends his disciples to go ask Jesus, are you the coming one or shall we wait for another? He didn't understand. He didn't understand this division of, of separation of, the, of mountains in the fulfillment of, of prophecy. And Jesus, he alludes to this, this text. Well, look what's happening. The blind are seeing. You know, all, all, there's all these healings taking place. John, you, you may not understand everything. Just trust me. Trust me. But one day, one day, Isaiah 35 will be fulfilled. As we read earlier in Revelation 21 and 22, there will be a new heaven and new earth. There will be the final phase of the final exodus. We will go to the true Zion. We have reached Zion already, but we are going to Zion at the same time. The already and not yet. And one day sorrow and sighing will truly be gone forever. We will be glorified and we will behold the Lord as he is. And he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. No more suffering, no more grieving over our sin. This will truly happen. So this leads me to the last part. Fourthly, the implications of Isaiah 35. Does this glorious portrait of salvation call us to do anything? Well, apart from beholding it, does it call us to do anything? Does it call us to action? Does it call us to respond in any way? In order to advance God's kingdom? And the answer is yes, absolutely. We see it here in verses 3 and 4. We're living, living in this already and not yet tension. And sometimes this tension can become overwhelming. Because although we have been saved, although, although we have entered into the Eden of God, although we are the presence of God as his church, we are the temple of God, we still suffer. We undergo physical ailments. We undergo the failure of our, our, our sin. We, we, we are like what is described in verse uh, eight, these pilgrims, some of which are foolish sometimes. We are foolish. We grieve over our sin. We hate our sin. And we can get be, be, become discouraged over suffering of this world. Persecution. 
the attacks of the enemy. We can become wary. And we're longing for the final fulfillment of this text. Lord, when are you going to come? When? When is this going to take place? Oh, Lord, come quickly. I am, I am sick of this world. I am sick of suffering. I am sick of being sick. I want healing, Lord. This can become overwhelming for us. So what is God's word to us here? We will end with this. Verse 3, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. What is, is the solution to our sighing and our sorrow? Strengthen yourself. Strengthen the weak hands. Hands in the Bible are symbolic of work and of strength. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might. We are called to work, to labor with our hands, to provide for our needs with our hands. We are called to lift up holy hands in prayer. So hands have to do with not only working, um, uh, earthly labor, but also working for the Lord. But when you're discouraged and when you're despondent, your hands hang low. You are, for the moment, useless for the kingdom of God. When you're discouraged, you are immobilized. You're not doing something for God, for his kingdom. And knees represent stability. Tottering knees represents instability. You're not going to be able to walk. The Bible commands you to walk in the Spirit. The Bible commands you to run the race that is placed before you. The Bible commands you to stand firm, to be steadfast. You're not going to be able to do this if you have weak knees. You lose your stability and you are going to be paralyzed and immobilized. Weak knees are, are not going to hold you up. In fact, you're going to fall. <laughs> They're not going to hold you up. Loss of strength, loss of stability. And in verse 4, it talks to us about the fearful hearted, those who are filled with anxiety, with anxious thoughts, who can't think straight. When you're filled with anxiety, you cannot think straight. You cannot think objectively. And you are so self-absorbed and consumed with your own problems in your own life. You're not going to be useful for the kingdom of God. So this is a spiritual paralysis that God is addressing here. And that is what happens when we don't consider what Isaiah 35 says. When we consider uh, all the, the outside dangers and even the inside dangers in our hearts. And we are so focused on all these dangers and all these trials and all these weaknesses. Our eyes are, are, are taken off of the Lord. Our eyes are taken off Christ. So the answer here then is be strong. Be strong and courageous. The same thing that God told Joshua. Moses dies and that, that was no small thing for Moses to pass. Joshua had big shoes to fill. Be strong and courageous. In 1 Corinthians it tells us, quit ye like men, be strong. Act like men. Do not be paralyzed. Strengthen yourself. Take your eyes off of yourself and put them on the Lord and hope in the promises of God. Gird your, the loins of your minds with truth. Put over your head the helmet of the hope of salvation. Meditate on those, those texts that talk about to us about the salvation that we have and the salvation that we will have in the second coming of Christ. Meditate on those texts. There is a, a story uh, one of my favorite theologians, Meredith Klein, who is a man, by the way, he's not a woman. <laughs> Meredith G. Klein, an uh, Old Testament scholar, uh, biblical theology uh, professor at Westminster and I think Gordon Conwell and other places. But one of his former students was doing an internship in a, at an o OPC church. And this former student's pastor was complaining about the way the student was preaching 
and he told me, he criticized me. He said, "Look, you're not offering the church uh, practical solutions to their practical problems. You're 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 just focusing on the pie in the sky before you die." That that those were his literal words. And so this student uh, pays a visit to his former teacher uh, Meredith Klein at Westminster, and he tells him what this pastor said about him. And you know what Meredith Klein's response was? Give me more of that pie in the sky. <laughs> and I say, amen, give me more of that pie. I want more of it. I want more of, the, of these heavenly truths. I want to be reminded of this every day. Because contrary to what some may say, it is practical. It's very practical to, to meditate on Isaiah 35 because there is a practical outcome of this. When we are filled with hope and with faith, we will be useful for the kingdom of God. This is why I detest that saying, oh, don't be so heavenly minded that you are of no earthly good. How can you be too heavenly minded? The most heavenly minded man on earth did the most earthly good that can possibly ever occur, <laughs> ever happen. <laughs> you cannot be too heavenly minded. So I say, give me more of that pie. Stuff yourself with pie. And we're not talking about pie over there in the fellowship hall, by the way. I don't want to be responsible for your health problems. <laughs> Stuff yourself with heavenly pie. We need more of that. And I'll just finish by reminding you that this text is uh, quoted in Hebrews 12. I'm not going to read from it right now. But just read Hebrews 12 and, and look at how the author of Hebrews uh, utilizes Isaiah 35 there. He, he, he says the same thing that we just read. Strengthen the hands which hang down, the feeble knees, etc. And he tells us to run this race. He exhorts us to walk and to run in this highway of holiness. He, he exhorts us to uh, not despise the discipline of the Lord. This discipline produces fruit, fruit of righteousness. It will produce a garden in your heart, an Eden in your heart. And he exhorts us to pursue peace and holiness without which no man will see the Lord. So he's telling us to be in the highway of holiness. And later on in the text, he tells us that we have come into Mount Zion, a place of rejoicing. So remember that. Remember all these truths. Exhort one another with all these truths so that we may together one day reach the heavenly Zion. Let's pray.